This is Revelation chapter 9, the fifth trumpet, part 4. Revelation chapter 9 tells us in verse 7, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And in verse 9, the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Once again, the symbolism being used here, and here it's the horse, this is Arabian. This is pointing us to the east. Edward Gibbon says, Arabia, in the opinion of the naturalists, is the genuine and original country of the horse, the climate most propitious, not indeed to the size, but to the spirit and swiftness of that generous animal. Edward Gibbon says, the charge of the Arabs was not, like that of the Greeks and Romans, the effort of a firm and compact infantry. Their military force was chiefly formed of cavalry. And so now we can see the direct connection, why it was that this army in Revelation chapter 9 was likened unto horses prepared unto battle. This army was not an army of foot soldiers, but it was cavalry. And once again, all of the details of the prophecy fit in perfectly with their historical fulfillment. B.W. Johnson says, There was not a foot soldier in the armies which in AD 632 assailed the Eastern Empire. Adam Clark, in his Bible commentary, says, The Arabs are the most expert horsemen in the world. They live so much on horseback that the horse and rider seem to make but one animal. Robert Carangola says in his book, The Present Reign of Jesus Christ, The Saracens were well skilled in fighting rear wood over their horses' tails. Verse 9 tells us of this great army that came forth and they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. Another remarkable detail. The use of chain mail or cuirasses being armour covering the chest and back, which is made of iron or steel, the use of this in battle dates back first to the Saracens. They believed that God had shown them how to make chain mail to defend themselves in battle. From the testimony of the Quran itself, we read this. And Allah has made for you of what he has created shelters, and he has given you in the mountains places of retreat, and he has given you garments to preserve you from the heat, and coats of mail to preserve you in your fighting. Even thus does he complete his favour upon you, that haply you may submit. Eliot says in the Hore Apocalyptice, The testimonies thus far quoted refer to three out of the four points of personal appearance noted in the vision, and on the fourth, that of the locust appearing breastplated with iron, both Antar, the Quran, and the history of Muhammad and the early Muslim Saracens will also satisf satisfy us. In Antar, the steel or iron cuirasses of the Arab warriors are frequently noticed. In the Quran, among God, God's gifts to the Arabs, their coats of mail for defence are specially particularised, and in Muhammad's history we read expressly of the cuirasses of himself and his Arab troops. Eliot quotes from Antar where it says, A warrior immersed in steel and armour. And again, 15,000 men armed with cuirasses and well accounted for war, and they were clothed in iron armour and brilliant cuirasses. And again, the dust opened and there appeared horsemen clad in iron, and then he cites several other references from Antar. The fact is that the historians of the Arabian Wars constantly speak of the iron coats of mail. And one final quote here from Edward Gibbon, where he talks about Muhammad's defensive war against the Kurish of Mecca. He talks about the 700 of whom were armed with cuirasses. So once again, we can clearly trace the prophecy to its historical fulfillment. Revelation 9, verse 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strike of the man. Verse 10, And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. 
and shown in this slide is the highly venomous fat-tailed scorpion from North Africa and the Middle East. And once again, we have another aspect of the prophecy, which is taking us to the east into the Arabian wilderness. And in this case, it is the scorpion. It's so clear that this symbolism used under the fifth trumpet is directing our attention towards the east, towards Arabia. The locusts are Arabian. The horses are Arabian. Arabia is very famous for its horses. The lion is Arabian. Scorpions are Arabian. And then their appearance is Arabian with their crowns of gold, faces as the faces of men, hair as the hair of women, and breastplates of iron. It's a no wonder that Alexander Keith said that there is scarcely so uniform an agreement among interpreters concerning any part of the apocalypse as respecting the application of the fifth and sixth trumpets to the Saracens and the Turks. It's so obvious that it can scarcely be misunderstood. Concerning the scorpion, the native locality was considered by the Israelites as the Arabian desert. We read from the words of Moses in Deuteronomy 8 verse 15, who said, Who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions. In this passage from the Bible, the king of Judah, which is Rehoboam, is intending to increase oppression of the people, and this is being likened to the torment of scorpions. In 1 Kings 12 verse 13, And the king answered the people roughly, and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him. And they spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. When we come to the time of the Saracens, under the fifth trumpet, the conquered peoples were given three choices. Number one, convert to Islam. Number two, paid tribute, or number three, the sword. And so the Saracens oppress and afflicted all the people of the land that they spread over. In Ezekiel 2 verse 6 it says, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Z Ezekiel is dwelling among scorpions, the rebellious house of Israel. These scorpions are, of course, those people that despise God and did not obey his word. Instead, they had frightful looks, as it were, and fearful words. In the prophecy in Revelation chapter 9, we are dealing with another people who are also frightful to look at with all the description that's been given. And also they have fearful words, those being the teachings of the Quran and Muhammad. So as we allow the Bible to interpret itself, we can cl clearly see what these scorpions are representing. The prophecy states that they had tails like unto scorpions and there were stings in their tails. In the Bible, the false prophet is the tail in Isaiah 9 verse 15 the ancient and honorable he is the head and the prophet that teacheth lies he is the tail and what do we have here in Revelation chapter 9 it is he who is the false and lying prophet Muhammad he is the tail Robert Carangola says this scorpion metaphor was fulfilled in the fact that the Saracens were well skilled in fighting rearward over their horses' tails. This is the dread of the scorpion, with its tail pain and tormented are inflicted. In a strange twist to the prophecy, we have these locusts coming forth, and then they are specifically commanded in verse 4, that they are not to hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. How strange. Then it got, goes on, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. These locusts are not to hurt any green thing. These Saracen locusts, however, were specifically directed against the corrupt professing Christians, Christianity within the Eastern Roman Empire. 
In striking fulfillment of this very aspect of the prophecy, we read from Edward Gibbon, who is quoting from Abu Bakr, who succeeded Muhammad after he passed away and became the next man to be the religious leader of the Saracens in 632 AD. And he said this, Remember, said the successor of the prophet, Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn, cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to cattle, only such as you kill to eat. These Saracens were specifically commanded not to destroy any green thing. Isn't that amazing? It's wonderful and it's marvellous. But, but, it goes further. He says, as you go on, you will find some religious persons who live retired in monasteries and propose to themselves to serve God in that way. Let them alone. And neither kill them nor destroy their monasteries. And you will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan who have shaven crowns, like what we see on the left-hand side of this slide. He says, Be sure you cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they, till they either turn Mohammedans or pay tribute. And of course, he's referring to the monks, those people of the false apostate Christian religion in the East, those which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And the record is clear, this is exactly what happened. As the Mohammedan armies went out, they did not burn down, they did not destroy the orchards and the green trees. Instead, they focused their attention on killing and subjugating those who had not the seal of God in their forehead, those apostate Christians of the Eastern Roman Empire. Robert Karangola says, Muhammad declared his commission to be against idolaters and unbelievers, especially the Mariolatrists, those who worship Mary as the Queen of Heaven, and saint worshippers of the Roman Empire. Robert Karangola says, Muhammad declared his commission to be against idolaters and unbelievers, especially the Mariolatrists, those who worship Mary as the Queen of Heaven, and saint worshippers of the Roman Empire. Edward Gibbon records an incident in which Muhammad violated his own law, the command not to destroy the green things. Muhammad actually destroyed the fruit trees during one particular siege, and we read here, but it was in vain that he offered freedom to the slaves of Taif that he violated his own laws by the extirpation or the destruction of the fruit trees. After a siege of 20 days, the prophet sounded a retreat, but he retreated with a song of devout triumph and affected to pray for the repentance and safety of the unbelieving city. And in a record called Journal of a Residence in Circassia during the years 1837, 1838 and 1839 by James Bell, we read this excerpt. My simple-minded, practical host and a man from Semez were disputants, the latter maintaining the impropriety of burning corn and the former its necessity on the present emergency. Our guest said, quote, it is contrary to the injunction of our book, end quote. He was meaning the Quran. And once again, it shows the command that was given to the Mohammedans not to touch, not to destroy the green things. And this is a wonderful aspect to, in connection with the fulfillment of the prophecy. As I get near to the end of dealing with this fifth trumpet, let's now take a look at the time restriction placed on these Saracen locusts. We read about this in Revelation 9, verse 5, five months, and in verse 10, again, five months. This symbolic locust creature was given a prophetic period of five months. Firstly, it is quite interesting to note that there are five months in each year when the natural locusts are most active in this part of the world. Now, that is being applied to these locusts of Revelation chapter 9. They also will be allotted five months when they will be most active, and these five months are 150 prophetic days as shown here. Like everything else we've been looking at, we need to understand the symbolic language that is being used. And when it comes to time measurements, these are also symbolic. Symbolic of something much greater than five literal months. In Bible prophecy, each day is symbolic of a year, and this is a very basic principle when it comes to understanding prophetic time measurements. 
I'm not going to explain it here and now because I have dealt with it at length in my series called An Examination of Preterism and Other Things from an Historicist Perspective. And if this is new to you, please turn to that series and part 20 in particular, which deals with this matter. You'll get all the details there. Now let's look at the key start date in the Islamic religion when the bottomless pit was opened and the smoke began to rise out of the pit according to the prophecy. In this article from Notable Biographies under the subheading Meccan Preacher we read this. At first Muhammad told these messages only to sympathetic friends but from 612 or 613 he stated them publicly. Many people in Mecca, especially younger men, became followers of Muhammad. These members of his new religion of Islam became known as Muslims. From this Time magazine article we read this. Jerusalem was central to the spiritual identity of Muslims from the very beginning of their faith. When the, when the Prophet Muhammad first began to preach in Mecca in about 612, according to the earliest biographies, which are our primary source of information about him, he had his converts prostrate themselves in prayer in the direction of Jerusalem. From the Catholic Encyclopedia dealing with Muhammad and Muhammadanism under the subheading The Founder, it says this, In his 40th year, AD 612, he claimed to have received a call from the angel Gabriel and thus began his active career as the prophet of Allah and the apostle of Arabia. From the Ministry of Hajj, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia website, we read this. In 612 CE, the time had come for Muhammad, peace be upon him, to announce his mission. He began to preach the uncompromising message of the one true God, of the urgent need to abandon paganism and idolatry, and so on and so on. And one last quote, and this is from the Iran Chamber Society, and it says this, The Bedouin Arabs who toppled the Sassanid Empire were propelled not only by a desire for conquest, but also by a new religion, Islam. The Prophet Muhammad, a member of the Hashemite clan of the powerful tribe of Quraysh, proclaimed his prophetic mission in Arabia in 612 and eventually won over the city of his birth, Mecca, to the new faith. Counting forward from AD 612 when Muhammad first publicly proclaimed his mission and preceding five prophetic months, which is 150 years, this takes us to another very significant date and this is the time the Saracens retire from their aggression and expansion policy and the Eastern Caliphate was established in Baghdad. The Caliph Abu Jafar al-Mansur founded the city of Baghdad on the 30th of July, 70, 762 AD. And by the way, the name Baghdad means city of peace. War was no longer a passion. The Saracen locusts ceased their period of operation spot on time. Like the natural locusts who are most active during five months of the year, the Saracens settled down to live up the good life, to live in luxury after the allocated 150 years of their most intense activity. Now, just as God brought forth a plague of locusts from the east upon Egypt in the time of Moses, so God also turned back that same plague of locusts by a mighty strong west wind, which took the locusts away and drove them into the Red Sea. And so it was with these Saracen locusts. God had allowed them to go only so far. They were allotted 150 years of their most intense activity. And then when the time was approaching, they were stopped thus far and no further. They were not permitted to kill. That is to permanently turn out the lights to extinguish either the East or Western empires or regions politically or governmentally, but rather the prophecy said that they were to only torment for a period of 150 years. When we get to the sixth trumpet, we're going to see that the situation will change and permission will be granted to slay and to kill. And we'll deal with that when we get there. As I previously mentioned, the Saracens had hoped to overrun the territories of both the Eastern and former Western Roman empires and meet in the middle in the north, but it could not be. A west wind came 
as it did in ancient Egypt. God raised up Charles Martel, the hammer as he was called. He raised him up in the west and he defeated the Saracens in Western Europe at the famous Battle of Tours in AD 732, and I've mentioned this previously. Following this, there was a split within the Caliphate, and the Saracens retired to the east to build Baghdad in 762 AD, and thereafter they ceased to be an aggressive, expanding threat. Now, it's important to realise that this Islamic Empire did not end here, but rather it remained a great force for hundreds of years. Nonetheless, its power declined and waned, as they pursued the good life and luxury from this point of 762 AD onwards. The empire was divided into various factions and caliphates. The five prophetic months had run their course, and the next cab off the rank is coming under the sixth trumpet. Concerning this period of time, and speaking about the city of Baghdad, Edward Gibbon says, In this city of peace, amidst the riches of the east, the Abbasides soon disdained the abstinence and frugality of the first caliphs and aspired to emulate the magnificence of the Persian kings. And these Abbasides were the ruling caliphate at the time. The luxury of the caliphs, so useless to their private happiness, relaxed the nerves and terminated the progress of the Arabian Empire. War was no longer the passion of the Saracens. And so once again, we can clearly see the turning point of the Saracens from aggression and expansion to sitting back and living it up in luxury. And you and I know what brought this about. It was the hand of God. He appointed their bounds. He had allocated them their time of five prophetic months, 150 years, to inflict pain and to torment. And when this was done, they were stayed. Praise the Lord, we know the God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the governor among the nations. That it was the hand of God in all of this is clearly evident from this statement by Edward Gibbon, who said, The calm historian, who strives to follow the rapid course of the Saracens, must study to explain by what means the church and state was saved from this impending and, as it should seem, inevitable danger. In other words, it was inevitable that they, the Saracens, should have overrun both the East and also the West, but they were stopped or saved from this impending and inevitable danger, as Edward Gibbon says, and we know that this was the hand of God. Praise the Lord. A similar thought comes from Henry Hallam in his book, View of the State of Europe During the Middle Ages, and he says, these conquests which astonish the careless and superficial, are less perplexing to a calm inquirer than their cessation, the loss of half the Roman Empire than the preservation of the rest. Again, it was a complete astonishment that the Saracens did not go on and subdue the West and conquer all of the territory of the former Roman Empire. But of course, we know that God had set the bounds and this is why the Saracens were stopped and turned back. As I conclude, let's remember that the prophecy said, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Muhammad, Muhammad claims to have received the Quran from an angel from heaven. But the scripture makes it clear that even if this were true, he should be considered accursed for preaching it. Galatians 1 verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Revelation chapter 9 tells us that the angel that inspired Islam was the angel of the bottomless pit who fell from heaven, whose name is Abaddon and Apollyon. And make no mistakes about it. This is a satanic religion and those that preach it are accursed according to the scriptures.
As I come to an end of this part, I'm going to conclude with a quick look at the papacy, or Roman Catholicism if you prefer to call it, and Islam. A comparison and contrast of the two reveals some striking similarities which are of interest. Firstly, both arose to prominence at about the same time in the 7th century AD. Secondly, the papacy arose in the former territory of the Western Roman Empire, whereas Islam, of course, arose in the territory of the Eastern Roman Empire. Thirdly, the papacy arose from within the church. It was the result of leaven that had been sown by the devil, whereas Islam arose from without the church. Fourthly, the papacy made war against the true church, whereas Islam principally made war against the apostate church. Of course, it's clear that both of these are covered off in Bible prophecy. So next, fifthly, both are described as desolating powers in Bible prophecy. And both, are, both come under the description of being a little horn. In relation to Islam, that is found in Daniel chapter 8. And if you're not sure of this, I invite you to go and look at uh, my series on Daniel chapter 8, which is on my YouTube channel. Clearly, the papacy had 1,260 years of total dominance, and Islam similarly had about the same period of 1,260 years of dominance. In relation to Islam, this is less clear, the exact period of time, so I don't want to be overly dogmatic on this point, but it was about 1,200 years. Both the papacy and Islam, of course, teach that salvation is exclusive to their particular religion. For the papacy, it is altogether necessary to be subject to the pontiff for your salvation. So salvation is exclusive to Romanism, whereas Islam, of course, teaches that salvation is exclusive to Islam. Both Roman Catholicism and Islam are based on a perversion of God's word. Both Roman Catholicism and Islam have mandatory fastings as part of their religious systems. Now, of course, Jesus told us that after he ascended and the Holy Spirit came that his disciples would fast. But this is not the same as the prescriptive fastings required under Roman Catholicism and Islam. Both Roman Catholicism and Islam have their prayer beads. The rosary is obviously the most well known in relation to Catholicism, but Islam has their own version of this. Both Catholicism and Islam are works-based religions. You always, you always have to work and keep on working to earn your salvation. In Islam, of course, one of the highest things that a man can do is to die fighting for Allah, which is the exact opposite of biblical Christianity, where our God... The Lord Jesus Christ died for us and praise the Lord for this. With works, of course, comes necessary pilgrimages that are to be undertaken by the respective adherents. Uh, and these are to different prescribed holy places. And I think that these things are quite well known. Now, both the papacy and Islam may be seen to be indirectly alluded to in the words of Jesus Christ found in Matthew 24, verse 26, where Jesus spoke of false Christs and false prophets. The false Christ, the vicar, the one who stands in the place of Christ, the Pope, is elected in secret in a chamber in the Vatican. And obviously, in relation to Islam, the false prophet comes from the desert. Both the Church of Rome and Islam venerate Mary. This may be a surprise to discover in relation to Islam, but it is nonetheless the case. In the Church of Rome, of course, this is quite to the extreme, with Mary, the Queen of Heaven, the Mother of God, being sinless, and so on. Nevertheless, in relation to Islam, the veneration of Mary goes way beyond that which is in the Word of God. Both have obelisks at the centre of their key places of worship. The Church of Rome has theirs at the Vatican, and Islam has theirs at Mecca. And of course, obelisks are essentially pagan phallic symbols. The papacy trod down the New Jerusalem, that is the body of Christ, the Church, whereas Islam trod down Old Jerusalem, 
over in the Middle East. The papacy claims to possess the keys of St. Peter to open heaven and hell to whom they will, and likewise Islam teaches that Muhammad was given the key to do the very same thing, and we looked at this earlier. The papacy, the Church of Rome, has sun worship up near front and centre of their religion, whereas in Islam we find the crescent moon and star as shown here. In this image of the crescent moon you will see that its position indicates that of the uterus and this is how it was used in early pagan religions and it was also found with the star within. And if you look hard enough you will find sun images in Islam as well as moon and star images in Roman Catholicism. And lastly, here is Pope John Paul seen kissing the Quran. While these two religions have fought great wars against each other in the past, they are in reality not too far apart at all. From Rome's perspective, they would be happy to have Islam in the fold of the Universal Church. All they require is that Islam, like all other religions, acknowledge the supremacy of the Pope of Rome. And as I conclude, Revelation 9 verse 12, One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter, and I'm going to be getting to those, God willing. This is the end of the fifth trumpet, part four.